Hi, Carly. I have Carly Iacono, uh, Marcus and Millichap. It's uh, Wednesday, November 20th. And thank you so much, Carly, for being on NetLease TV. Uh, Carly is a NetLease sales agent and you represent buyers and sellers of NetLease. Correct, Carly? Correct. And Chris, great to see you. Thanks so much for having us on your show. Really appreciate Thanks the opportunity. Thank great you connect. so much for being on. So our team, I'll give you a quick background on our team and then we can kind of jump into some deals and, and take it wherever you want to. So we have a national net lease business practice. We do represent buyers and sellers. And mm -hmm. the way our team is organized, we have experts in each of the major food groups of net lease. We have someone focused on QSR, fast casual restaurants, um, convenience, drugstores, et cetera. So we really have a, a deep expertise in the net lease market. Um, and follow all of those tenants very closely. Now from a buyer seller perspective, we have a tremendous market coverage and audience. So we do a great job pushing value for sellers, but we also have a very deep 1031 buyer uh, pool, which is a big part of our business as well. So um, you most, so now where are you located exactly? Are you in New York? Are you in New Jersey? Do you, are you in that general region there? Exactly. So both. Our office okay. is in Saddlebrook, New Jersey, which is right by the George Washington Bridge. We're in the city a lot, of course, meeting clients, and we have a New York office as well. Is your have, Were you raised in New Jersey? Is that where you're originally from, or did you move? I wasn't. So kind of a funny mix. Uh, okay. I half grew up in the Gulf Coast of Alabama on the oh Florida gosh. border, and the other half in Pittsburgh. So, so that's kind of a, a shock when you went when right? you to New Jersey. That's kind of a different environment. You're kind of a fish out of water, I would imagine there. No question. No question. So I've been up here for a long time. My first job was in litigation consulting right out of college in uh, Manhattan. And then I stayed since then. That's a great background for NetLease, no doubt about it. Um, with the contracts, the leases, you really have to have a, a strong foundation in legal. Would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, it definitely helps. So um, tell us about some of the transactions you've closed or that, that you're listing or, or buyers you're representing. What type of net lease deals are you doing? Are you doing single, multi-tenant? Now you said you have different facets. You have like a team, right? And some of them do QSR, exactly. some do pharmacies, some are doing uh, C stores. Uh, Give us a little bit of a flavor of the type of net lease transactions, uses, tenants that you're dealing with at this time. Sure, absolutely. So we've closed a few very high profile net lease transactions recently, and we have a very significant shopping center on market as well, which I'll touch on. So in the net lease space, one transaction that I know you and I have connected on before was a Home Depot zero cash flow deal that we just closed last week in mm -hmm. West Mifflin, Pennsylvania, which is right outside Pittsburgh. So this was a unique deal because not only is it one of the few Home Depots that trade in the market, but it was subject to a zero cash flow debt structure. And typically zeros are drugstores, CVS and Walgreens. We don't see a lot of other tenants uh, in the structure. So this was a very interesting transaction. Um, I, I know you're familiar with zero cash flow, but maybe some of our, our viewers are not. So I'll give a quick background on that as well. So in a zero cash flow deal, the income from the tenant perfectly matches the debt service on the loan, hence the name zero cash flow. And the reasons okay. people buy this, um, there's a multitude, but primarily it's a tax shelter. And obviously we can't give tax advice, but I'll kind of high level tell you some of the advantages. Um, a zero cash flow deal will throw off passive losses that you can then wash against passive income from other sources. You also okay. could control very significant amounts of real estate with a low equity investment. So these are very, very highly leveraged deals. Um, uh -huh. The debt is usually self amortizing and non recourse. So it's going to be paid off through the term of the loan. There might be a small balloon at the end in this specific transaction there was, um, but oftentimes it'll be fully self amortizing. So you're actually building equity in the deal during your whole period um, mm. with very little money out of pocket going in. So those are just some high level things um, to, to consider if you are looking for a, a way to diversify your portfolio, adding a zero might be an interesting thing to throw in the mix. Does someone coming into a zero cash flow, do they need it? You know, I get people calling me to finance mm -hmm. zero cash flow deals and they think they can just go into a deal with no money. 
what what should be the expectation of a buyer buying one of these and what is kind of the makeup of that client sure so there's a few different buyer pools but the notion that you need no money is certainly not true there's a certain percentage equity over the debt that you must come to the table with so the percentage equity over the debt not to be confused with percent down because those are two different metrics but the percentage equity over the debt will vary anywhere from about 13 to 20 percent of the deal depending mm -hmm. on the deal structure the home okay. depot that i just referenced had a balloon payment four million dollars so that brought down the initial equity over the debt to 13 and a half percent and that's where the deal closed 13 and a half percent equity over the debt uh, we're also currently marketing a portfolio of Walgreens zero cash flow deals. Those are on market at 16.5% over the debt. So a higher equity requirement because there's no balloon payment at the end. So with the, the transactions that you're working on, the buyer has to assume the debt. Correct. It's not fresh debt. Like it's, it's not a Walgreens or a Home Depot that's unencumbered and the buyer is going out and getting debt. Basically, there's debt in place. This buyer buys the property and there's an, an assumption involved with the transaction. Is that correct? Correct. So we'll do both types of deals. Um, but the standard zero cash flow structure is the debt is already in place and the buyer is buying it because of the zero cash flow debt. So that's actually a draw to the transaction. Now, we do a lot of unencumbered deals and come to people like yourself and other lenders who uh, have very competitive financing terms. So, you know, we can all obviously approach a deal that way as well. But if we're marketing a deal as a zero cash flow deal, then the debt is already in place. Have you heard anything on the FASD um, putting leases back on the balance sheet? What, is, what has the, been the effect with companies wanting to do balance, uh, sale lease backs with leases now considered debt? And is that affecting companies uh, their their debt covenants because before maybe they had a low um, debt to equity now their debt to equity is higher now that they have to put those leases back on the balance sheet as debt or do you have any feelings on that subject yeah it's definitely changing things um, we are not experts in lease accounting so I don't want to go too deep into sure. this but what we're seeing overall is tenants are writing shorter leases so there used to be you know, 20, 25 years of options with a 20 or 25 year base term. So very significant, 50, 75 years total lease term. That's definitely being reined in. And a lot of our new builds, we do work with a lot of developers and then sell the finished product. Those tenants who are even on a, a brand new build to suit might only be committing to 10 or 15 years, or even as early as five years ago, we were getting 20 or 25 years. So we're seeing tenants pull in their overall lease term and then commit to less options as well. So have from an investor heard, standpoint, that's that's a negative. Have you heard anything, Carly, on Proposition 13? I heard they're trying to repeal uh, Proposition 13 for property tax, and, and property taxes are going up for a lot of landlords out there. Um, do you think that could affect the apartment market where like people, and rent control here in California, there's rent control. Could that have, an effect where people in California say, you know what, I may want to sell my apartments and head to Ohio and buy a net lease deal where I don't have to deal with deadbeat tenants, leaky faucets, um, you know, roll, roll out of apartments because they're worried about rent control, hikes in property taxes. Of course, with a net lease, in most cases, the tenant takes care of the property tax. Now, that's not good for tenants, but you know, for landlords, uh, they don't they don't really have to be as concerned with that with a net lease deal as they may have to with a apartment complex. I think that's one of the main draws of net lease right now is just stability. There is so much uncertainty in the financial markets and the political markets that people are really looking for something that they can model out over the next 10 years with some degree of certainty. So having those expenses be fixed or on the tenant is a huge benefit. Um, I personally think everyone should sell apartments, sell the apartments, sell the industrial, move to that lead. I'm a little biased, um, I mean, but I, I do think that certainty is one of the big draws right now. You know, it's so, um, the, the, all the markets, as you say, it's definitely a political market and government 
oriented market, you got to think about everything that all this legislation coming down the line that if you're an apartment owner is going to affect you or if, if you're going into net lease because there's so many different things happening. Um, like we said, the FASB, they want to hide property taxes, they want to put rent control. And these all are factors um, that if you're looking out, um, you're the captain of your ship, you're saying, okay, what's next? Where, where should I go with my ship? Mm -hmm. um, and this is an interesting thing that you mentioned to me. Explain the benefit of a pay down readvance. How does that work? Who would want to use it? And uh, do most lenders want to do it? I, you know, I've encountered it. There's been a couple lenders that have told me about it, but you mentioned it. You seem to know it intimately. Expand on that. So this is a provision we like to see in all of our zero cash flow deals because it's one of the main benefits of the debt structure. Um, how it works, you can actually temporarily pay down a loan balance and then re-advance it after closing. And the reason you would want to do this is largely driven by the 1031 exchange. So if you have an all cash in exchange or you have a, an exchange with minimal debt and you want to acquire a zero, you can use your excess equity, temporarily pay down the loan balance and then re-advance that excess equity above and beyond the say 15 or 16 percent required to buy the deal and you can take that excess equity out tax-free thereby st um, satisfying your 1031 exchange and then you have the funds free to do whatever you might like whether it be invest in the stock market buy a boat whatever it doesn't matter okay. at that point so it's a mechanism okay. by which to pull money out of real estate okay. by avoiding okay. capital gains tax and as carly said you know for our um uh People out there watching this interview, you always want to consult a good CPA. We're not giving you tax advice, a good lawyer. We're not giving you legal advice and a good insurance agent. Before you go into a net lease deal, you need that team of professionals around you. Um, one law firm that we utilize is Flores Mavic, Yvette Flores, James okay. Lekowitz. I don't know if you know that. Yvette used to work at Walgreens, McDonald's. Excellent right. law firm, Carly. If you ever want a good law firm, they've done a lot of leases. They know this stuff intimately. And, you know, what I find sometimes uh, the buyers that have maybe that are doing smaller deals, half a million to a million down, they don't really have adequate professionals around them. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do a deal without a lawyer. And I think right. that you really need somebody, if you're not doing this every day, you can't go into it like you're buying a car. It's real estate. At the end of the day, you know, there's survey issues, title issues, lease issues. You really need a, a good attorney to review all those documents. Would you agree? You're exactly right, Chris. The deal team is crucial. So that does include a great financing professional, a very strong attorney, your tax accountant. And we find that sometimes professionals that you might have used for other parts of your life don't translate to your first real estate transaction. So our private clients who are new to real estate often come to us and look at net lease as an entry point into the market. And that's a crucial first step is for us to set up this deal team for them from all angles of the advisory services. Um, so and then there's some more complex things like cost segregation when you get deeper into the tax benefits that uh, you really need a, a professional to advise you on. Are you doing smaller deals? Like for me, for the finance, I'm doing deals like a million to two million purchase mm -hmm. price area that's a really hot area for me and then i'm doing the deals three to ten million but i'm doing more deals smaller loans like a million and a half two million and then i'll get some that are three to ten but there's a huge market right mm -hmm. in that you know two to three million smaller deals do you do smaller deals or are you just strictly focusing on you know much larger deals so we really run the full spectrum. We have a, I'll give you an example, we have an $850,000 Starbucks we're marketing as a team right now. Uh, and then we have a $70 million shopping center. So a wide range in between there. Home Depot was 19 million that we just closed. We closed at Dick's Sporting Goods last month for 17 and a half million. We have an academy coming to market at 10 million. So we do a lot of the larger net lease deals, but the, the QSR and the the discount space, those are going to be one to $3 million deals. And that's a big driver of our business as well. So that's been a big driver for you. How do you deal with phantom income on the, on the zero cash flow deals? Again, mm -hmm. we're not giving tax advice, but I'm familiar with it because 
your interest is here and your principal is going up, right, during the loan. So somebody can right. deduct interest and depreciation, but if your interest is going down and your principal is going up, but you have zero cash flow, in the IRS's eyes, it looks like you're making money. How do you deal? How does an, a landlord deal with that investor going into Correct. a zero cash flow deal? Yeah, and you you explained it well. It, it's really that inflection point when you start paying off more principal instead of interest on your loan. Typically, we don't see that until about year 11, 12. But again, it will depend on the basis that the investor brings over in their acquisition. So that all is a, a larger tax conversation. But two things that are important to remember on phantom income. One, it's not a light switch. It's not all of a sudden you have a tremendous amount of phantom income to deal with. It's a very gradual um, sort of switch as that interest okay. principal balance changes. So this this is a creep. It's not an immediate, oh my goodness, how do we handle this right now? So it's not as dramatic as you might think. Uh, and there are ways around it. You could add additional debt in the form of a wrap loan to increase that interest expense. You could sell the property at that point and trade into something else with a higher basis. So there are options when you get to that point. And again, those are models that we would like to work with any of our clients' tax advisors on to make sure that we have the full picture for them. In most of the uh, zero cash flow deals, they're investment grade credit, right? Triple B minus or better. Can you can you do they a have to be. Can, yeah, so you can't do a zero with like a double B plus. Correct. 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 Is there certain individuals like um, that are doing these deals? Like I know for a while, Roger Staubach. Roger mm -hmm. Staubach packaged a lot of the CBS deals, the 7-Eleven deals. I remember when I first got in the business, he was selling those deals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I think what they had done is they defeased the loan after they got the 100% financing or whatever it was. And then he was selling to the, net, the secondary market at much lower cap rates. And then I was like financing 7-Eleven deals that he had done a sale lease back. Um, okay. There was another gentleman that we dealt with, uh, my dad dealt with many years, Louis J. Glickman. Louis mm -hmm. J. Glickman was a syndicator in New York. And, um, you know, he was kind of the grandfather of NetLease. He, uh, he was going to actually buy Carnegie Hall at one point. And if you look, if you Google Louis J. Glickman, you'll see he did a lot of sale leasebacks with the railroad. Um, and he, he was a professor. Um, you know, one of those guys that's very highly educated. You know, this wasn't a normal uh, broker, per, you know. So, okay. so anyway, do you see those kind of people today that, you know, you could look in your Rolodex and say, hey, call this guy. You know, maybe he's he's a player for this deal. I absolutely do. And a lot of those are some of my top clients. So, so, on so that you have a network of people you can just go to and, and say. Just buy zero deal. cash flow deals. Mm -hmm. We do. What? It's a small buyer pool from a, a professional or a larger institutional level client. Uh, so typically we'll sell for those clients and, and we work with them on the acquisition side, too. And then we'll structure the 1031 exchanges for buyers who need a highly leveraged exchange or they want the pay down re-advance. So we are transitioning from that, you know, taking the deal from the, the more professional or institutional client and selling to the private market as well. So um, what advantage would you give a seller that has, let's say they have a, a Jack in the box or a Walgreens or a CVS? What is your main um, uh marketing campaign you know do you do like guerrilla marketing what what are your steps to to list the property how do you get that property in front of buyers how do you get a lot of offers on that property what is your strategy to to be effective as far as listing a property and, and selling it quickly at the best lowest cap rate highest price and best terms with the highest shorty of close that's the goal Exactly. So it's a very structured process. Um, we have everything outlined on a, a timeline and a grid. Nothing we do is accidental. And it really goes property by property as to what we feel is the best approach. But it typically starts with professional drone photos, video, if that's warranted. And, and then we put together a, a very complete and professional marketing presentation. We'll share that on a national level through a myriad of sources, both internally through the Mark Similich App Network, 
We're reaching all 2,000 of our brokers in the U.S. and Canada. We're a very collaborative firm, so that's a great place to okay. start. Um, we'll go to other sites, CoStar, LoopNet, Crexy, PropertySend, you know, all these different sites that just to get more eyes on the deal. Our goal is really exposure and clear professional presentation because we feel that the more eyes are on the deal, the more 1031 buyers are looking at a property, the more competitive a market we're going to be able to make. Uh, in addition to that, we have extremely deep brokerage relationships in the community. So we have, as a team, spent a significant amount of time building relationships with all the other major firms. And some of those brokers might just sell industrial. They might just sell multifamily. And those relationships allow us to control a very large pool of 1031 buyers that not only is driven by our team, but that are referred to us from teams across the country. So uh, it's a matter of, of marketing and, and then relationship. Okay, where's the marketing going as far as, you know, you got Amazon, right? The mm -hmm. Amazon pretty much uh, changed the way we buy things, you know, people, which is not good to some extent because I enjoy going into a mall and being socially involved with people. I don't think it's good just to always order everything on your computer. Yesterday I deposited checks with my phone, you know. And so I don't even go to the bank anymore. And it's like, you know, where's the interaction with people? So sure. where, do you, where do you think uh, the sales of net lease properties are going? Do you think it's going to change? Um, I know when I first got into it in 98, there was no LoopNet. There was no Craxy. Right. Um, there was no CoStar. Um, the market wasn't as, um, I'm trying to find the word. Like the stock, it wasn't like the stock market because mm -hmm. you really didn't have information to know where cap rates were supposed to be. So it was very, I'm trying to find the word now, but I can't, I can't remember. It was siloed. I think, you know, it, 10 years ago it was siloed. There was no access to information and, you, you know, you, you were limited as a buyer to the few people that you knew and what they told you, whether it was true yeah, or not. So, so, so where uh, is now it going? That's, where is it going in the next five to 10 years? How will the sales of net lease properties change? And what do you think are some innovations that'll be good for buyers or bad? Sure, so we've already seen a huge shift with the introduction of Crexy. Okay. Massive marketplace, a lot of deals are on it. But what's interesting is we've seen a swing back because the flood of information is causing massive confusion in the market. So if you're a buyer, even if you own two or three properties and you now have access to 2,000 listings, it's virtually impossible to fully understand those deals on your own. So we're finding buyers who maybe a year ago were saying, mm, I, I like this deal, I like this deal, I know what I'm doing, now become completely overwhelmed and come to us and say, you know, we really need an expert. We need someone who understands the market. There's a lot of change going on in retail in general. There's a lot of change in the overall real estate market. How do we sift through everything that's out there and make an educated, wise decision instead of just picking something because we now have access to it where we didn't before? So I think right. the consumers are getting more savvy. They have more information at their fingertips, but it's also too much. And a lot of what's out there is not clearly presented. It might not be available anymore. There's a lot of time being wasted uh, by buyers. Just like if you Google anything on the internet, most of what you're gonna get may not be very high quality information as feedback. Sure. Same with the real estate market. So I, I do think there's been a, a swing back to uh -huh. a need for real guidance and professional brokers in the market, which has been great for us. Do you, um, the one thing that I used recently, I'm doing, um, what am I financing? I'm financing a Pizza Hut. Okay. And um, I, think you guys are Those aren't easy. I think you guys are on the sell side. I can't remember. But anyway. What, I, what was really cool for me is I could just take my phone, okay, and I, I scanned like a letter that I sent the lender with a FedEx mm -hmm. tracking, bang, I sent it off. I don't even have to scan anymore. I can just use my phone practically for everything. I can mm -hmm. be anywhere. Um, is there any cool apps that you can mention? We're always trying to find out new technology that you use in your business. Um, do you use... Um, do you, do you use the old fashioned way of doing contracts? Or do you, I'm trying to think of, I, I still am kind of old fashioned in that regard. I don't have the, I'm trying to think of the program where you send it out, they click on the contract and it automatically does. 
What's that? DocuSign. Uh, it's yeah, called Doc DocuSign. You use DocuSign? Uh, we love DocuSign. I love wish DocuSign. all my clients would use it for every LOI, every contract. They don't. Uh, we're maybe 50-50 right now. We're trying to get everybody onto DocuSign. It's just so much more efficient, easier to manage the documents through the entire deal process and have digital copies right away. Um, but we have a lot of clients who are old school, will hand sign things. I got a fax yesterday of a contract. That was kind of exciting. Haven't gotten a fax in a few months. Um, <laughs> it's not, so we it's still not, have it's crazy. old school, old school uh, clients as well. And we have uh, one client that we're doing a deal with right now. We're about to bring to market who is physically mailing hard copies of phase ones and surveys. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it depends on the client. Well, that happened with me for the Pizza Hut. I actually had to go down to the buyer's uh, business and help her, you know, fill things out. Okay. And I, um, I basically, I got everything together and I scanned it and then I went and overnighted it, but I used my phone. I do want to use DocuSign. When you're using DocuSign, is it hard uh, for the client if, to make changes? Could there be a situation where they say, hey, I wasn't able to change this thing. I saw, I just, it was so easy. I signed it and now I don't want to do it. Could that circumstance come into play? It's always been my kind of fear that they may say, oh, it was just so easy. I clicked the thing and I didn't really yeah. look at what I was clicking. I would hope no one would sign something without looking at it, but that could happen in a <laughs> digital or a print thing. It does happen, right? Um, Are they able to amend? Are they able to amend a contract in DocuSign, or is it just that's it? I, I don't think so. It's pretty set, and that's by design, right? It's meant to be a final copy that you're signing. So if your attorney okay. sent you, here's our final copy, it's the same kind of thing. Here's okay. the final copy. We've all agreed on it. We don't want to allow changes because then it would defeat the integrity of the process. So is there any, not to, not to, to beat on a dead horse here, uh, is there any technology that you can mention that would help principals, agents, loan brokers with their phone or their computer that, that you really enjoy using that makes your business easier? Yeah, so we're pretty streamlined in what we use. We don't rely on a ton of apps. Um, obviously, with NetLease, there's no property management involved. I think if on the shopping center side, there's a good number of apps that are helping landlords manage multiple tenants. I have probably 10 or 15 that I've seen, none that I know well enough to recommend. On the single tenant side, it, it, there's no need for that. Um, on the brokerage side, we use Apto as our CRM. We do a significant amount of internet marketing. We use all the major tools that I think most people use. Um, and we just try to keep everything digital. Um, we use our own property website, so that's an important okay. thing as well. But nothing, um, nothing unique that you know, I think perhaps you wouldn't have heard of. For us, okay. LinkedIn is a really big part of our business. We're finding that that's a great way to reach other yeah. brokers in the market, principals. Uh, we're relying on LinkedIn more and more. LinkedIn, LinkedIn. okay, mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Yes, for sure. LinkedIn is, uh, that's how I think I learned about you, is on LinkedIn. <laughs> it's great, such a and great, it's working. Yeah, it's, you know what's nice about it? You know, you go to ICSC, but LinkedIn, it's consistent. And then right. when you go, if we go to ICSC, maybe we meet up for lunch or coffee. You know, we kind of know each other because we've chatted on LinkedIn and now we've done this interview. I think that's exactly. it's a great way to for people to know you, trust you, and like you, and get to know you. Um, you mentioned centers. Uh, most recently, I worked on a center, and I don't like to, you know, try to focus on you know negative things, but I'm very much a realist. Uh, you know, sometimes with these centers, there's a little ambiguity uh, with the CAM and the REA and the CCNRs and who pays for this, who pays for that. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, it's very important for the buyers to really review all those documents because there could be some obligations with a multi -tenant, in a multi-tenant center that maybe doesn't pass through to a tenant. And a lot of the mm -hmm. buyers are not considering that. You know, I think that's one area that just because it says it's net lease, all net lease is kind of different. It doesn't mean that they're all the same, that the taxes, the insurance and the maintenance. Maybe that tenant has different uh, liability and property coverage, right? 
-hmm. one tenant may have better than the other. So it's important. The devil's in the details in these net lease. Would you agree? I would. And I think there's a big difference between single tenant net lease and multi tenant net lease. Okay. So on a multi tenant center, it could be a, a net lease, which is just the three basic nets, taxes, maintenance and insurance. But that doesn't really touch on uh, roof structure and some of the other you know, things that would pertain specifically to a multi tenant property only. On a single tenant, it's very easy to say, is this true absolute net? Is there any management involvement at all? Is it a ground lease perhaps? So the, the structure and the terminology and how it relates to the property is different whether we're talking about single or multi-tenant. I would say to anyone, if they're looking for something that's truly passive, no involvement whatsoever, maybe it's in another market, another state, single tenant is gonna be a much easier investment. With multi-tenant, although it may say they may be triple net leases, there'll always be some level of management involvement. Could be camera reconciliation at the end of the year. Could be roof um, maintenance. Whatever it is, um, it's impossible for one tenant to be responsible for the whole center. So you, you will have some level of management. Could be minimal, but there's something there for sure. I think when the, uh, when the federal funds rate went down in September, mm -hmm. uh, that was huge. And oil was coming down, the price of oil. I know in California, we were paying about 350 a gallon now we're back up to four and a quarter and rates you know 10-year treasury got down to right around uh, 150 now we're at right. about 180 we're up 30 basis points um that was a huge time for the net lease market i know that for myself i got really busy at that time and i can see why if you're you know with the federal funds rate lower if you put your money in the bank you're getting less than two percent when net lease, what would you say your average return? Five to seven, maybe? And so you're getting yeah, I think around three, six. Three, three to you know, five hundred basis points over what you're gonna get in the bank. I think that mm -hmm. really got a lot of people off off the fence to buy net lease. Cause I know that for myself, we were doing a lot more loans of September. Um what what do you think, I, I think the first quarter will bring? What I think what's interesting yeah, go ahead, right Carl. now, what's interesting right now is there is a very nice spread between interest rates and cap rates. So it's almost less important where cap rates are. It's that spread between your interest rate and cap rate that is, is so important to determine your overall return on equity. Um, so when that interest rate decrease happened, we did not see cap rates go down which was interesting. We thought they might, but cap rates are already so compressed that if anything, they've actually ticked up, I would say about 25 basis points on an average over the last quarter. So if your rates went down, your cap rates are flat or a little bit up, that's gonna widen that spread, which I just mentioned, and, and make investing in net leads even more attractive. So I do expect that to continue for Q1 of next year. We still have tremendous velocity. We have a lot of inventory coming to market. Um, so I think as long as rates stay low, we don't have a lot more instability politically or financially as a company, uh, as a company, as a country, uh, then I think Q1 will be very strong for us. Q1 will be strong. I, you know, it is an election year, but we've got a lot of uh, cross currents, right? You know, um, a lot of cross currents going on. So it's hard to really predict what's going to happen next year. Um, I think that, uh, the third quarter is gonna be really strong. This third quarter will find. Mm -hmm. I think fourth quarter will be a little bit not as strong, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the first quarter. But rates are starting to come down again. And um, like you said, I think it's really a political economy. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what happens uh, in 2020. Uh, the, the one thing that you can look at, we did have that you know horizontal yield curve, where mm -hmm. the short-term rates were about equal to the long-term rates and it was starting to invert. I think right. when the Fed lowered the federal funds rate, it kind of came back like this, which okay. is good, I guess, for the economy. Um, so now where are you gonna be? What are some events that uh, you know developers, other agents, principals, institutional buyers can meet you? Are you gonna be Absolutely. at ICS? Uh, we are. We're everywhere, Chris. We're okay. everywhere. Always okay. out in the market. Okay. ICSE New York is a huge conference for us. We'll be there in full force, of course. Uh, we'll be at the ICSE Nexus Conference in Miami the following month. 
Um, we'll be in Vegas for Recon. There's a lot of regional conferences uh, and events that we'll be at as well. Basically anything commercial real estate related in the New York tri-state area, someone from our team will be attending. Um, but the best place to meet in a structured format would be ICSC New York in just a few weeks. And what's your goal of ICSC to meet developers? What, do you, what is your goal? Do you have like a set goal when, when we go, sure. this is what we want to do? Always. We have a set goal for everything. Okay. Everything's planned out. Everything um, has a goal. To maximize our time at the show. So we will plan meetings every half hour all day uh, for the entire two-day period. And the goal there is to meet new clients, new developers, new REITs, institutions that we may not know. I mean, we've got pretty good coverage at this point, but there's always new people entering the market. There's always new private clients or those that are transitioning to a more professional business model and owning multiple properties uh, that we don't know. So we love to meet new people. We'll also be spending a lot of time with our clients from other parts of the country. Conventions like this is a great time for us to really connect with people that aren't in the New York metro and just catch up on what they're doing, what they have planned for next year, and make sure we're their go-to source. So um, how can somebody reach you? Um, are you going to be working during the holidays? Uh, do you like people to call you on your cell phone, your normal phone? Can they email you? Do you have a website? Um, do you do go-to meetings like this with clients? Uh, what is your best way of interacting with clients? Or do you want to meet clients in your office or other offices? All of the above. All, All of the above. above. So we're happy to do conference calls. Email intros are, are great or fine. LinkedIn, video conference is fine if that's a client's preference. Love to meet clients for a cup of coffee or lunch out in the city if they're New York based. Um, so really what's most convenient for the client and we'll uh, we'll share that information as well. Uh, we do have a team website, iaconoretailgroup.com. So that's a great way to reach us and see our current inventory. Okay. Um, but direct call and email at any time is fine as well. That's awesome, Carly. Um, I will be in New York for Thanksgiving. I'm looking forward to going to the Macy's Day Parade. Great. So I'm going to be in Columbus Circle with my daughters and my wife. And uh, this will be the first uh, winter I've ever been to New York. I've been to New York several That's times warm. in the summer, but I've never been there in the winter. So I'm, I heard it's going to rain though. That's a little disappointing, but we'll see. I'll have all our, we're all going to be having gloves and it'll be cold. I will be drinking a lot of hot chocolate. There uh, you go. That's great. Enjoy. It's a fun anyway, time to be in the city. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So thank you so much, Carly, for being on NetLease TV. Um, are you going to become a patron of NetLease TV? We're looking for patrons. And definitely tell everybody at Marcus Millichap to subscribe. Hit the subscribe okay. button so that whenever we do these type of video feeds, they're going to get an update by email. But we are okay. looking for patrons. Some of our patrons, um, Ted, we've got a guy, Ted, and a couple other. But I will put them up at the end of the video so you will see our patrons. Excellent. And um, definitely become a patron so that we can continue to have you on the show, promote you, promote your business. Um, right now during the holidays, I'm closing a lot of deals. So if you need to call me, all right, I, you can call me seven days a week. I love the holidays. I get a lot of deals during Christmas. You can reach me on my cell phone, 760-803-6468. And then for our current rates and that, our website's pretty cool. You can get all our current rates. If you're on the run, you can download our rates on your cell phone. Uh, what else? There's interest rate information on our website, all kinds of good stuff. The NetLease TV. Our website is www.maradellafinance.com. So um, Thank you again, Carly. Happy holidays to you and your family. Hope maybe I'll see you in New York. And thank you so great. much for this, this interview today. Thanks My again. My pleasure. Thanks again, Chris. Thank All right, you. take care. You too.